So I, I just want to thank you for wanting to have this conversation with me in community uh, with other artists um, across different places, a different, you know, different qualities of life in this particular moment in time, right here and right now. So as I, <clears throat> as I take you in, I'm thinking about how we met and under what context and how much has emerged <laughs> and changed since that dinner uh, several years ago. Um, for me, this is an invitation for us to be who we are in our practice and in our friendship and allow that to be witnessed uh, in service of the potentiality of, of anything that may need to be evoked or provoked for someone in this audience. That that isn't really for us to worry about other than to provide the presence that is required. So our humor, our joy, our creative imagination, our blackness, our queerness, our living aloneness is all material for this conversation. Um, so the image uh, for this conversation is a still shot from John Lewis's body Bring, being taken over um, the bridge where he was beaten for a last time, as if by doing that ritual, somehow a black body wouldn't be beaten again in this system. And that is an indulgence. Mm -hmm. And it enraged me that his own intervention around how he wanted to close himself out in his life, right, was not what we were left with to wrestle with. That mm -hmm. instead, in addition to, we chose to react with how we handled his body. Um, so when I think about my own practice and yours and the ways in which they're mostly perceived as different, that we recognize that there's a materiality that is similar um, mm -hmm. around the physicality and the labor required to understand what it means to live in a black body in this environment, in this experiment we call America. And while that is a thread in the practice, it is not the motivating catalyst for the work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from my perspective, um, and this is a conversation that we had out there that I'm bringing in here, um, that there is a distinction between death for people of African descent in the Americas and an interruption by this system, mm -hmm. by white supremacy, culture, attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs, practices, rituals, ideologies that contribute to our lives being interrupted mm -hmm. with no space for grieving. Mm -hmm. Because the next step is always symbolic, some kind of activism in service of white culture. So we're still asked to perform in, in our death mm -hmm. some kind of care and aliveness for this system. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about it in private, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about it in ways that to support each other, to be friends, and to care for ourselves while we stay alive in a moment, historical moment, where people who live in bodies like ours are dying at a higher rate than mm -hmm. others. 
and still needing to do the thing that we do, which mm -hmm. is make art. Mm -hmm. So that for me is the, <clears throat> that's the ground that, we, that we're standing on in this conversation. Um, and I also wanna invite you to share what's, what's on your mind and heart or what's being evoked right now, not necessarily the things we've talked about out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I do kind of want to touch on what we talked about out there. One thing that <laughs> one thing that Carmen and I do is like uh, a lot of times we get together on the weekends and we have we have fellowship over the phone or um, via Zoom with a little bit of coffee to <laughs> almost to kind of like for me to start out the week, you know. Uh, like a Sunday coffee with Carmen, I always um, really look forward to. Um, and it was one of those Sunday mornings with coffee that you brought up the interruption and it completely shifted how I thought about this past six months, um, the ways that I was formulating my work around efficiency, and productivity and um, it has just permeated everything that I think about in relationship to what my body is doing in the world and what is happening to my body in the world. Um, we, you were there <clears throat> as a friend for me when my grandfather passed away from COVID in April and I kept trying to um, I kept trying to make sense of what happened what happened to him and um, the, the way that I made sense of it was that oh well he was older he was older, he was, he was 80, he was 86. And so I kept trying to say to my mom and to my aunts um, when we were talking about his passing and what to do um, to go to, to the funeral, to watch it on Zoom, um, to go to the funeral home, uh, to go to the hospital. Um, some of those decisions were made for us. <clears throat> meaning that we couldn't engage in, um, in, or my family couldn't engage in the ways that they wanted to. Um, but um, I kept trying to make sense of it. And I kept thinking of his age. And as soon as you said the word interruption, I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? <clears throat> isn't that interesting that I tried to wish away his death because of his age. And I wonder if I would have done that if I was another race. Mm. Like, I wonder, I wonder if I would have done that if I was white, if he was a white man, you know? I wonder if I would have had um, more, more anger about it, you know? Like, his life was taken away. And I think that, um, I think that I internalized this interruption in his life as something natural, as something natural. Oh, okay. It's too early to cry, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and um, I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned about that um, naturalizing um, black murder, you know, um, and yeah, so I just wanted to, I wanted to bring that into the space from the thing that happened before. <laughs> um, because this is something that you've been talking about a lot, about um, when our bodies are interrupted, just like you were just talking about um, what, um, what happens to us afterwards, what happens to, what happens to legacies, what happens to our image. You know, this is something that we both work um, work uh, through in our our in our in our artistic practice. 
um, what's happening to the images of people who are interrupted. Um, yes. And um, as people who are living, um, who are living, hmm. how are we able to um, to see when our lives get interrupted the, each time, each time, each time you're pulled over by the cops, each time you're getting an aggressive, passive aggressive email by a curator um, because they're <laughs> racist. Each time you're, you know, each time, each time you're, um, uh, you have to pay more out of pocket for your health care because the government isn't doing the things that it needs to do each time each time, um, how, do, how are we able to acknowledge when those things are happening? And then um, what can we do to, um, is, there, is there a way to sidestep? Is there a way to see it coming? Mm -hmm. mm. So for me, the answer is uh, yes, there is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that answer is art. It's what we make, it's what we talk about, it's how we um, use ourselves in our practice, not to explain, but to show. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's an, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be present for you after the death and the interruption of your grandfather's life and to be present to witness you say that age, his age doesn't matter, you know. Um, but the choice to be able to close ourselves out of this experience in our bodies is something that gets taken away as a part of um, this system's conditioning for how we are to use ourselves in it. Um, and the cumulative impact of continual interruptions also contributes to the disease that develops in our body, which mm -hmm. then impacts our ability to make work. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I think about Camilla Billups mm -hmm. having Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. I think about um, my own grandmother, you know, who died before we met, as, as if her closing out opened this potentiality for me to meet you, for the learning and that of her that lives in me to give me some kind of insight in my practice to connect with you. I would not have an art practice without grief without mourning as a material to catalyze my practice. When my great grandmother died, I was 16 years old. This is my first um, understanding of what it meant to lose a relative, to lose somebody who had cared for me. At her funeral, a woman named Jessie Reeder was the choir director of the church that was handling her service. I only met Jesse uh, this year and didn't know that Jesse was the choir director, right? I just mm. experienced Jesse's intervention in that role. And so when we went to the cemetery to put my great grandmother's body into the ground, we were all surrounded in this large group spread across the cemetery. And at some point when her body started to be lowered into the ground, the choir started to sing the song. I don't know what the song was. I just remember the vibration and the shift in the atmosphere of the sound of these voices covering mm. the group of people who were mourning my great grandmother. That catalyzed my first questions around death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that catalyzed this practice that I'm using right here and right now. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when my grandmother died before I met you, I had the ability based on the environment to be present with her, to hold her hand until her pulse 
was absent. Mm -hmm. She stopped breathing before her heart stopped beating. And so what does it mean for a black body in this system to stop breathing first? Mm -hmm. When the white nurses had to come in and for 30 minutes try to clock her end of life time and they couldn't do it because she's, mm -hmm. her heart was still beating. That was a form of communication to her loved ones. And I had the ability to receive it. Mm -hmm. So what is the communication that your grandfather is having with you, given your practice, given the materiality of your practice for you to witness his, his ritual of end through Zoom? Mm -hmm. How is that joining you? How is that feeding the work? How is that a gift to you? Is the, and it does not erase the interruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, st I'm still trying to, because I, I worked a lot with my family and after he passed, I watched a video where he was the first person that I addressed in, in the video. I asked him, he was standing, <laughs> He was standing on the porch and I wanted him to stand behind my aunt. And so I'm asking him in the video to stand behind my aunt. He's just not listening. <laughs> and so I ask him over and over and over again, Grandpa, please stand behind Aunt, aunt Sheila. Please stand behind Aunt Sheila. <laughs> and um, it was wild because the last time I saw him was on the same computer mm -hmm. that I was watching the video on. And I am still trying to figure out what that is. Yes. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to find what's, what has been left behind. Mm -hmm. What has been left behind. Mm -hmm. um, I, did, I, did I tell you that the, 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 the day, the, the, the night before he passed, yes. I told you about that, right? where I felt there, there was someone in my apartment and I, and I don't have a giant apartment. And I just opened every door that I could, every closet door. I just knew that there was someone in there and <laughs> there was, it was no one. And the next morning I had, I got the news that, um, that he was gone. Um, and so I'm still trying to reconcile that. I know that was a gift. I know that was a gift. That was something that he left. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to talk about your doula. Mm -hmm. Carmen is a doula. Carmen is an end of life doula and a birth doula. And I'm really, and I didn't know that about you. I went, I went, I, I did my research. <laughs> I, I, I did my like academic research and I, I, I knew you cause I know you, but I wanted to know some more. So I went to the website and saw that you were a doula. And um, I am so cu curious to hear you talk about your doula -ing in relationship to your work, mm -hmm. what it means to usher a life into the world, usher one out of it. And it, thinking about that, thinking about the altar work that you make, mm -hmm. um, this space, uh, this interstitial space of in and out of in between mm -hmm. um while also being like a like again like an usher an mm -hmm. usher into an usher into life and us an usher into the great beyond and then making a space where that also happens yes yes as a practice yes well um <laughs> it's it's all birth sandra you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as, as I heard you kind of list and create the, the intersections for you, how, for me, what came up for me is being a two spirit person. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, one teaching 
regarding two spirit people is that we are, uh, you know, both male and female. But more significantly, the teachings tell us that two spirit people are uh, are stewards of the edge, mm. Mm. birth, death, you know, naming, healing making of art you know that that is a that is a gift of being a two-spirit person so my attraction to those edges to those intersections and to the potentiality of those intersections for me is the work all the time mm -hmm. so i look for that you know i look to make contact with you at the edge of meaning at the edge of possibility at the edge of transformation and paradoxically in order to birth anything you have to be deeply present in the here and now mm -hmm. in the deepest and clearest of ways because if we cannot be right now with right here right now there can be no transformation. Mm. There can be no change. Mm. And that is what enrages me about oppression. Mm -hmm. Because the mm -hmm. distraction of it interrupts your ability to be in the here and now. Yes. The fullness of your power in the fullness of your potentiating energies as a maker, a doer, an artist, a human being. Mm -hmm. And the distraction of the busy work to keep me out of the here and now. Mm -hmm. Clean this, fix this, explain this. Who are you? If we go back to the communications with curators and museums and galleries. Mm -hmm. Even the work of calling an institution a white institution is distracting me from making work. It is not mm -hmm. my job as an artist to fix, heal, even condemn an institution that we in this ecosystem have imbued and reified with whiteness. Mm -hmm. I am an artist, you are an artist. Either they steward our work and the potentiality for that work or they get out of the way. Mm -hmm. But it is not my work to fix them mm -hmm. because that takes years off of my life. It is an interruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes years off your life. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think about that all of the time now. After the initial conversation around this, I don't know when that was. It's probably at the beginning of us having <laughs> having uh, of breakfast and coffee and all of the, and all of that about the years the years that are gone <laughs> the years of making the years, the years of love that were taken of the years that were taken that there we go there we go it's it's important to use precise language in this mm -hmm. um, the years that were taken mm. so even before we were born sandra mhm mm mhm mm mhm mm Mm -hmm. I had dry skin when I was born. How is someone living <laughs> in a water environment <laughs> born <laughs> with dry skin? If, if that isn't systemic oppression. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it permeates everything, including yeah. the yeah. embryonic sac. <laughs> embryonic sac, yeah. Wow, wow. 
so can so, we talk about some of the sorry go ahead so so i was going to ask you about your work <laughs> so, because oh. when when you said embryonic sac it made me i saw an image of your work you know and mm -hmm. there's a certain um you know in your video installations there's a certain uh, it feels like the stuff of creation bubbling around in a lot of your mm. installations mm. it's primordial mm. for me you know mm. yeah uh yeah i am i'm thinking of the the thingly space mm. I love that word primordial and I'm going to continue using it. Thank you. <laughs> Fuck the Anthropocene, Sandra. <laughs> Fuck the Anthropocene, whatever that means. <laughs> Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's the thing we space. It's the space where there's immense possibility. Yes. Um, uh, but we decide what that possibility is. Like, I, you know, like, there's a lot that can, that can be, that can bubble from that spring. Um, and I want to be cautious of what I conjure. Um, mm. the, uh, the flesh wall has been coming back into the work and back into the studio um recently um it like won't go away and i'm thinking the reason why it's here is because it's my body but it's my body in a way that i haven't been able to see myself mm. um in a way that um that i sometimes can't see myself like it's a unruly being the flesh the flesh wall is an unruly being. And I think I want to be an unruly being. <laughs> you know, it also makes me think about the Orisha Amolu, who mm. is an Orisha of, of plagues and of mm. plagues, um, on the body. And so oh, wow. for me, there, there's something in that about its return um, mm. to support kind of you and your practice moving through and getting to the other side of this experience that there's some purpose in the work and in your life mm -hmm. on the other side of of this or whatever will emerge from this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you so much i'm gonna hold that i'm gonna hold that um but i also want to say this about your about how you describe that that work is for me you called it flesh mm -hmm. and so i think about the interruption from the potential of people understanding your work mm -hmm. when they do a comparative to white male video artists mm -hmm. which is a simple simpleton way to frame and understand and miss the potential meaning they could be making from experiencing your work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for me that too is a part of taking something away mm. even in showing it even in viewing it but talking about it and making and, and making ascribing a meaning to it not making meaning ascribing a meaning to it that fits into the tiny imagination of somebody else's subjectivity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes that happens often is <laughs> 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 making just making the world that uh that i helped usher in because i think it's helped you know it's a uh, um it's a part i'm a part of I, I'm still trying to formulate what I mean around this, but um, I feel like I'm like a cog in a machine that the work is uh, it, um, that the work is using to show up in the world, but making that world very, very small, very, very small, flattening it, just mm, condensing it in a way where it can't breathe. Or it's just, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, that's annoying. <laughs> it's and it takes it's taking away. It's taking it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Mm. So, Carmen, um, in in the work, in the work, in the practice, how are you? Um, uh, how are you? Not confronting, but um, uh, dealing with this taking away. How is it showing up in mm. uh, in the work? Well, one of the things I've been thinking about is vengeance as a material mm-hmm. and how this mm-hmm. notion of yes. <laughs> <laughs> how claiming vengeance is a form of grieving mm-hmm. because the catharsis is required. And one of the things the system is asking me to do is, you know, reconcile and heal and repair without this other ritual. And so for Mm -hmm. me, the physicality in the altar work is a reclaiming and a taking vengeance because I'm giving space to what has been taken from those who have come before me and for seen and unseen. You know, I create a container in the installation work, in the altar work for for them to speak and communicate with this environment. Mm-hmm. You know, so I often use doors in, in installations, um, really creating, you know, uh, a doorway between the seen and the unseen for a moment, for this temporary experience of this, this altar, this installation, for them to communicate with whom they want to and, and with who they do not wish to, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think there is uh, uh, a fundamental uh, shift that we need to make around the need um, to claim vengeance Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the ongoing cumulative thing that is, and I don't mean, you know, um, uh, I mean, I feel like there's a certain level of creativity that's required in vengeance, you know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) yes you know so i think about the film like the wife the thief the cook and her lover do you remember that film sandra have you ever seen it no i've never seen it everyone this is where sandra and i are different there's a decade (laughs) plus of difference (laughs) it's on the list it's on the list list. (laughs) so like you know helen Mirren's lover is murdered and she cooks him and serves the cook serves the body of her lover to the the folks who had caused the violence. Um, and it's, a, it's very beautiful, you know, visually in the film. But this notion of what is the ritual required and the need for the witnesses in order to get us to a place where we then can integrate the learning and, you know, move towards reconciliation. So I, I, I effort to offer that or the potential for that or examples of that in the work. Um, so for example, the video, um, um, some notes on racism. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, so the, you know, part of that for me was, was, was how art can be a material for that vengeance mm-hmm. to get it all out of the body, to give it back. There is something required in those of us who've been the targets of oppression to give the materials of that back to the oppressor. We don't need to mm-hmm. claim it, own it, replicate it. You know, there is a, a force that needs to be larger than the forces of the oppressor. And art can do that. Our work can do that. Our practice can do that individually and collectively. And probably needs to do some more of it. Mm -hmm. But I collaborate with my ancestors. They, you know, I I Mm -hmm. imagine, you Mm -hmm. know, they're with me right now in this conversation with you, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
you know, this is my grandmother's chair I'm sitting in. Mm. 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 But I've been thinking of that in relationship to my sound work. Um, you know, what is the what what is the sound of vengeance, or the vibration, mm -hmm. the vibratory quality of it? Because there is. Um, there's anger that I carry that doesn't belong to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be attended to. Mm -hmm. There is grief, there is sadness that does not belong to me, that it's been passed on, that the circle mm -hmm. has not been complete because of ongoing interruptions and things being taken. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, um, are those things, mm, it feels like they're not, it, it's, it's not an exorcism that they need. It feels like it's something else that they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's they, not a removal. They need to be. They need to be seen. Right, it's seen, yes, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. They need to be excavated, yeah. not exercised. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, which is interesting. I think, um, like, I think a lot about um, uh, this uh, this trying to exercise um, uh, the like things that really just like need to be in a body of their own and mm -hmm. uh, and need to kind of like live out um, live out their purpose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know. So now that makes you um, think of your work with the, 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 with the equipment that you ask the, the viewer to like physically excavate and see mm -hmm. in, in, in the design of it, the discomfort in the physicality of excavating mm -hmm. and seeing. Yeah, because they, they're just trying to live their lives. They're trying to prolong their lives, <laughs> those machines. They know that they are made to be used. And they say, hey, hold up, hold up. I know what this means. If you're here to use me, that means at one point I get used up. So yeah. I am trying to make sure that I live a long, prosperous life. <laughs> and so that means when you use me, I'm gonna make it difficult for you. I'm gonna make it really difficult for you to try to use me in the ways that you want to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why the pedals are on backwards. Yeah. That's why there's a there's there's hair gel in the the rowing machine, so it makes it difficult to get a good quote unquote um, uh, uh, work workout. You know, all mm -hmm. of these things that make uh, make the bro uh, make making the body more um, physically prosperous or or prosperous in work harder. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's like I yeah I'm, I've been thinking about that for a really for a really long time. Um, this this need for um, uh, like you were just talking about this need for catharsis before mm -hmm. the real work happens. Yes. 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 Um. So one of the things I don't know if you read the book. Um, uh they were her property you know where they talk about um oh, not yet mm -hmm. uh that 36 percent of slave owners quote unquote were white women mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in that book uh, via my friend's storytelling my friend carrie's storytelling that um for our ancestors to be able to work as enslaved people that we needed to consume almost 4,000 calories a day in order to do mm. the level of labor that was re required as enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So I think about that when I, when I think about both the obstruction and the kind of sadistic quality in the labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 
because you know uh. and then critique us right for then being physically exceptional in some way mm -hmm. when you've conditioned our bodies mm -hmm. to be exceptional when you have bred us to be exceptional mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, someone has to get a gender test because they're beating everybody running track, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, you know, paradoxically, you know, you tell a whole culture of people that they need to assimilate, you know, and be French. But as soon as the Olympics comes, it's nothing but black bodies running for your nation, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So for me, I have to fundamentally think about not just the physicality that you're talking about in your work, but the differentiation between my human experience and being a black body in this system. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that when people take me in, they take me in as an object, not as a human being. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. That Brianna, Brianna was not taken in as a human being. Mm -hmm. Her body was murdered. And then in her death, she became an icon. Both things are objects. When mm -hmm. does she get to be a human being? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean for, for us as black artists to be asked to collude in that level of objectification? Mm -hmm. We're not either mm -hmm. kings and queens, you know, or enslaved people. Mm -hmm. We get to have the multiplicity and variance of all of creation. As I told you before, I bought it. I bought the magazine, Sandra. Mm -hmm. And I have to question myself into why. I purchased it, right? So now again, our bodies are still for sale. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. So my practice cannot reify what this art world, what this system, what this microcosm wants us to be. It still has to be a here and now potentiality, not a reflection of what you want to buy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the invitation? Do artists of color get to invite like any artist? Mm. I'm cheating. I'm looking in the Q&A. Someone asks, do you each conceive <laughs> body and flesh as synonymous? Do bodies and flesh show up differently in your work? You know. I mean, just my instinct is when I think of flesh in your work, you know, I, I see something that grows, something that's alive. And when I think about bodies and being black bodies in a system that's a, a, a structural location, not embodied, not my embodied experience as a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm about to go there again. Have you ever seen the film, The Dark Crystal, Sandra? Oh yeah, oh I have, I have. <laughs> So for me, blackness in this culture is the equivalent to those indigenous people, you know, who were stuck in them chairs for the skepsis to suck out their life force and they drank it. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is racism in this culture and particularly how black bodies are used in this culture. We give this construct life. Mm -hmm. mm. And when it mm -hmm. gets low, when it gets low and the skepsis are looking, need a little Botox shot of blackness, here we come. Mm -hmm. 
the elixir of life mm. in this experiment we call America. Mm, Jesus. That's that's my experience, Sandra. Mm. And it and although it seems ugly, it resonates for me. It yeah. makes it clearer for me to understand these dynamics, clearer for me in my practice, clearer for me in allowing the work that is required of me to make to emerge. And I want to support other people to be as clear as they can be, my friends, my colleagues, other artists, other folks doing work around change, to be able to be in a container where they can wrestle with and investigate um, what is in the deepest way. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a theory in Gestalt that says, uh, Arnold Beiser coined it, change occurs when one becomes what he is, not when he tries to be who he is not. Mm. 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 And for me, that's the function of art. To embody what is and allow people to wrestle with that what is for the mm -hmm. potentiality to do something different. Mm -hmm. mm. Michael Rackwitz asked a question I wonder what an end of life processional might have looked like with vengeance in mind. Yes. <laughs> because what Ooh. we are left with is a bookend of America making John Lewis's traumatized body to do the work for the system that killed him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also that grief isn't some the expressions of grief are not just the kindly, you know, wrapping myself up in, you know, there's many things, you know, one of my, one of the most beautiful expressions of grief is the statue in Richmond, Virginia, for me. That monument became mournful with the graffiti and the, the it's, it's being wrapped you know, mm. the, the, the act of tagging it, you know, isn't mm -hmm. just, you know, it's a misstep to simply look at it as rage or anger. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. You saying a lot of mm mm's. What's going on? <laughs> uh, well, this is like this is how our conversations go. <laughs> I vibe. I vibe on the genius. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> you know, I think part of it for me is, um, you know, when I hear a mm, I feel like something just bubbled up, so I'm curious about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a, a raggedy in scope, if not fully formed, I'm still curious. It might be raggedy. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking about, <laughs> I'm thinking about what Michael just wrote mm -hmm. um, and, um, and about the work, um, the work that um, the dead are asked to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it just makes me, it just made me sad. That's all. Mm. It just made me a little bit sad. Mm. Mm. Yes. And I know, like, remember when we were talking about, like, he, he had, he, he um, passed a prostate cancer. Yes. Um, and I remember you, um, you convinced me to get this book about um <laughs> about like uh, different inflictions in the body and what it could mean like psychic like uh, psychically to your um uh to your uh how do you how would you say it like uh, hey you know how to heal your yes. body you know yes and, and you know that's the um, title of the book but what 
the process of how she wrote the book was simply tracking the, uh, what people were saying to her and what their physical illness was. And she saw a pattern. So it's a book of mm -hmm. patterns that were documented. Um, and so for me, what's interesting about the patterns is that you can apply it to the systems level or the group level. Mm -hmm. so why do people of color have certain illnesses? You know, high mm -hmm. blood pressure, diabetes, <laughs> mm -hmm. prostate mm -hmm. cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm aware that when you ask me to keep my rage and my grief and my sadness and anything that gets evoked in me inside of myself and take away opportunities in the system to express myself in mm -hmm. my purpose, I might develop high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the mm -hmm. longings of my heart are never attended to. Right. Right. And so thinking about how all of this stuff can't get excavated, like there's nowhere for it to go. There's no for it where for it to go. So it causes harm in the body. Yes. And it's it I it's I think it's something that we should be looking into about like like these like these gener generational. It's <laughs> happening at like generation after generation after generation. Like this is it's like really concerning, I I feel. <laughs> um uh that we aren't thinking about the 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 psychic the 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 psychic component of what physical illness is doing um and i think that like one of the ways to um address that and get it out the body is through the making of art mm -hmm. which is which is why class society needs to be destroyed so <laughs> more people can make art <laughs> Uh, um, uh, among other things, um, but yeah, yeah. So my hmm, my hmm, my hmm, my hmm, in was <laughs> just like kind of reflecting, reflecting on that. The, the other, the thing that I want to add to it is also the value of friendship mm, for mm -hmm. artists, particularly for artists of color. Yes. <laughs> because when you were describing, like, you know, these physical illnesses that emerge due to these things, you know, all I kept thinking about was a particular arts institution that I had to intervene on. Mm -hmm. And the catalyst for the intervention was my body talking to me mm -hmm. through pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Saying, Carmen, you need to make a decision on how mm -hmm. to act. Not how to react, but how to mm -hmm. act in service of your practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and remember I this want, very clearly. And I don't, I I don't, want, my, I don't <laughs> want my body to have to tell me. <laughs> yes. yes. We don't want to get to the point no, where no. we are incapacitated and and your body's saying you gotta well you gotta listen to me we don't want to get there we don't want to get there mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> no no and i you know and and at this point our art cannot be present to explain to people what oppression is sandra mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not what it's for. It's not explaining anything. Mm -hmm. And although there's some work out there that is, um, you know, people are paying attention to it, mm -hmm. but it's, the work is collusive in its seduction, mm -hmm. in its mm -hmm. aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Or in the package of the artist. You know, so one of the reasons mm -hmm. that I'm enjoying this conversation with you right now and being in community with you right now is that I really 
don't want another black cishet male to explain art and race mm. and our community ever again without understanding that it's a gendered experience that they are having mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of our people, of our community, of their practice. Of, you know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is not my experience. Because it reinforces this very experience where a white curator, arts administrator, blah, 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 instead of being in the here and now with me, with you. Well, I was reading um, something that such and such said, or I was on a panel when I curated this with so-and-so, he said this to me about race. No, this is what I'm saying about mm -hmm. my experience. This is what I'm saying about race. This is the meaning I'm making. This is what it looks like in my practice. Either it resonates with you or it doesn't, but do not pit artists of color against each other through their mm -hmm. practice, through their words, through their experiences, through their standpoints, particularly black artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is what happens. There's a triangulation that occurs that is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a poor curatorial practice to even have this tiny imagination mm -hmm. in the communication that you're having with people's work. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's, it's tiny imagination. That's exactly, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Mm -hmm. And if you can't share with me what's on your mind or the meaning you've made as a scholar practitioner, then, then you're not ready to do the work. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. But that seduction to do the work and to do it quickly because it's the hot thing and healing is the hot thing mm -hmm. and care right now and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have to get our statement out about black people and we care and mm -hmm. You don't care. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. care about your job, you care about your salary, you, keep, you care about whether your museum can open, whether um, you can get funding if Black people come or not. And none of it tracks back to the work, none of it tracks back to anyone's practice, none of it tracks back to the potentiality of what a public program could be or engagement or thoughtful connections and creating possibilities for mm -hmm. people to make more art. Mm -hmm. You know, if we strip it down to the most fundamental, these institutions are, don't have an art practice. So then what is their work then? Mm -hmm. Their work shouldn't be to disrupt or you know, interrupt or take away, but their job is to create space for people, for art, to interact. And that's it, but that's not a sexy enough job title, Sandra. Mm. Mm. I also, I mean, I think that there is also something that has to do with like, the fundamentals of those of these spaces right like we're t we're talking about we're talking about like spaces that are supposed to leave space for artists to make work but mm, I like I wonder if that's actually what's going on like mm -hmm. I wonder if that's a, if that's actually um, if that's actually the, the goal um, <laughs> in the so in, in a whole because um, it shouldn't be this difficult. Mm -hmm. And I know we're black, but it shouldn't, it really shouldn't be, it shouldn't be this difficult. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm still thinking about what you just said. Um, yeah, I mean, as you say it, I think the goal is power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the power associated that we have imbued on arts and culture organizations. Mm -hmm. 
So my identity is tied to the power attached and associated with my proximity, certain places, spaces, yes. institutions, mm -hmm. roles. Mm -hmm. And then when I get caught up in it, and I lose my, you know, I lose my teeth, so to speak, mm -hmm. what do I have left? Mm -hmm. My whiteness wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm. You know, then let me get aroused by the harm that I do to artists of color, people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. still there's no and still there's no place for mourning. Because everything's being everything's happening so fast. Yeah. You know, it's like wanting to tie up um uh tie up ends. Um wanting to um go, hey, yes, Black Lives Matter quickly. Yes, <laughs> without investigating how your institutions function in the first place, how they how they um how they harm black people in the first place. How many black people are coming in through, through your doors? <laughs> how many? How many? What kind of outreach are you doing? How many black people work there outside of your um, education department? You know? In our city, instead of talking about black bodies, they just talked about zip codes. <laughs> mm. Mm. Which is horrifying. Mm hmm mm hmm Mm. When we talk about infant mortality in our city, we talk about zip mm. codes. Mm -hmm. When we talk about access to internet, we talk about zip codes. We don't talk about placement. We don't talk about the systemic intervention of denying access based on mm -hmm. what kind of body you were born into. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so my doula work for me and my practice is also about supporting people get to the end of this, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a resistance yes. right now to things changing because this is not us. These aren't sustainable practices. It's one that gets mm -hmm. you resources, gets you power temporarily that's outside of yourself, but it's never sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a level of resistance to the forces for change at the moment. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is also where art is important. You know, I don't believe in Black Lives Matter murals on streets mm -hmm. that buses drive over driven by Black people that garbage trucks drive over driven by bl black people that are cleaned mm -hmm. by black people. Mm -hmm. That is not what is required. That is not mm -hmm. what art is for. Mm -hmm. Mm. So if that if that if those actions aren't if they if they aren't art then what are they? Are they placating? Are they? It's rebranding. Um, it's rebranding. Mm. Mm. Sustained by black people, like you just said, mm -hmm. there are black people making them. There are black people cleaning them. There are black people driving their buses over them. Um, uh, giving it life. Yeah. Giving it life. Ma again, making Black people do the work again. Mm -hmm. Again. All over again. I mean, I think um, about the, the quote-unquote controversy of the Philip Guston e exhibit not being in, installed in a couple museums and people confusing it and saying, you know, this is the time to show work like this and blah, blah, blah. And you know, 
but you have to understand the system. The system wants to show work by black people talking about black lives. They don't want work critiquing whiteness or white supremacy being installed. Mm. That's not mm. the conversation they're interested in. So of course it's going to be shuttered. Mm -hmm. The potentiality to make new and more profound meaning in his work lives right here and right now. Mm. So instead, mm. this is the time to give people like you and I opportunities, you know, to show work, mm. to have solo shows, to be in conversation with each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's 7.45, we're scheduled to um, 8.30. And I have a feeling mm -hmm. 15 minutes isn't enough for Q&A. Mm -hmm. Do we wanna open okay. it up for more and invite others in or do you wanna keep talking? Uh, let's uh, let's uh, open up to Q&A, let's do it. Okay. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of everyone here, uh, Atomzik and EFA Project Space and um, our participants, uh, thank you for having that conversation um, with us and calling us in um, to listen. Um, my name is Arthur Russell. Um, and I'll be joined by Amani and uh, perhaps Dylan, if you want to pop on at some point too. And we're, we'd like to open up now. Um, we have some questions that have popped up in the Q&A box, but we encourage uh, participants to place their questions, thoughts, and impressions uh, in, in that box, and, and we'll give voice to them as we can. And um, perhaps we can also have a few folks kind of talk about uh, the power of the relationships. Uh, I just really appreciate that point from Carmen and Sandra that uh, the role of friendship in this space. So maybe we can also talk a little bit about the relationships that brought us to this moment and what might sustain us going forward. Um, so we'll, as uh, questions appear in the box, we'll, we'll give voice to them. Um, I know I have a lot, I'm sure, but I won't be selfish. I won't abuse the moderation function. We'll give folks some time. So go ahead, Dylan. I, I was only going to pop on uh, for a moment and just um, you know thank you all. Um, you know, in particular, um, thank you, Sandra and Carmen and um, and Carmen and Arthur and Imani um, from Atansic for um, for you know coming to us with this um, this proposal. Which you know I think just to say for for a moment um, the the kind of inverse um, you know. Uh, format that we discussed was uh, to kind of save the introduction for later. And I, I was really, um, I felt like jumping right into it was like um, uh, a really special kind of connection with, with both of you to be entered into your conversation. So I just wanted to thank you, Carmen and Sandra again for, um, for allowing us into your conversation, into your, your Sunday coffee convos. Um, and, uh, and to say that um, on the kind of personal um, the connection side, you know, I think, um, uh, the connection with um, with with both of you through we have a project space um, that you know you've been in, involved in in shows here and Sandra you you had work in um, the show that was curated by Tarana Fazeli um, Sick Time uh, which was incredible incredible work and it was actually one of the first times I saw your work in person so I was really grateful uh, prior to my be uh, being a part of um, of the the administrative team at Project Space and um, and Carmen I got to know you and your work through the show that um, that you were in last year with Jillian Steinauer. 
um, in the presence of absence. And, um, and that conversation, I think, uh, allowed us to kind of do our own, uh, well, they haven't been on Sundays, but, um, but some really, really nice extended conversations that I really appreciated around um, care. And, um, and I, I don't want to, you know, lead with a question if there's other questions out there, but I did just want to say that I, I was interested to hear more about um, a, a tonsic and how that connects to your practice and maybe to this work of, um, you know, I hadn't really associated it to the idea of, or the or the proposition of vengeance or the the place that a tonsic might also hold within that because in the name it doesn't say that it says, you know, <laughs> uh, it's you know a center for center for healing, right? And and. <laughs> But, um, but now I want to hear more, and um, and I, I don't know if you know if you or Imani or Arthur um, can talk a little bit more about how Atonsic, um maybe came to be, and then how it connects with um, with your practice, and and what it means to to also be running this. You know, I don't know if you call it or think of it at this point as an institution, but as a you know as a as a place, a site, um, you know, a structure, a building, a gallery, a residency, whatever. You know, it it is all of these things, right? So um, yeah. And then I'll, um, I'm going to mute myself, and, and but I'll be here. Thanks. Um, Great question. I'm just going to respond to, to the one question that Dylan has said. You know, healing often hurts more than the wound. Um, and so mm. there's a particular kind of space that needs to be created to support um, what it means to, to heal. Um, I want to shift it over to Arthur and Amani, and you can talk a little bit about the project. Amani is uh, the inaugural intern at Atonsic, which is a urban retreat and residency space in predominantly African American and historically Hungarian neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio. And I founded a project there in a residential space that is now. Um, both a space for um, artists and creatives and change catalysts, but um, it's a space that nobody wanted, and now it's something mm -hmm. new again. And mine mm -hmm. is our inaugural intern, so I'm so excited that they are with us. <laughs> Introducing to the space and to everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think for me, I'm struck by the liveliness of a tonsic and the continuation and like the momentum that a tonsic is moving at. Um, because I feel that I've come in at a moment that's a culmination of all of these experiences and memories that primarily like you have had and you have thought very critically about. Um, so I feel like knowing a tonsic and spending time with a tonsic is also knowing you and spending time with you and mm -hmm. your knowledge. So. I think we broke up there. Um, I would just like to echo that. And I just want to thank um, Dylan as well for opening up space to talk about Atonsic. Atonsic has been a big part of uh, my life this last year. And it really is, again, an outgrowth of, of my own relationship with Carmen as well as the space. And I think that to me is what I was hearing also in the conversation is there's something about like this idea of art and the institutionalization of it, and I'm really speaking out of turn here, but there's something about that where I've always longed for something more personal, right? Something more vulnerable. You know, I come from the, like, I, I teach in the university and, you know, and I, I like to think about a classroom as this kind of space, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm in this institutional level and like there wasn't this uh, outlet in some ways or a space to, make my own vulnerability and the vulnerabilities of community and practices of hospitality to really press into that. And then um, through my own conversations, my own coffee times, and um, well, we used to be backyard moments, 
Carmen, but now it's on, on the online um, moments. Um, those conversations and those relationships began to happen. So my relationship to Atonzik, um, the Atonzik is a house, as Carmen says, and it's in the process of, I think it's finished being remodeled. And so there's good things coming. But even though I haven't really stepped foot inside the house, I have feel like I've been adopted right into kind of this space and almost welcomed home to a home that, you know, I think I didn't know I had and in our, some of our practices and programming that we do together. One of them is in, in theory and practice. It's a, a working and reading group. I think as people find their way into that, um, where, where I see the, the mission of Atonzik is and kind of the practice of Atonzik, it's almost like there's a kind of welcoming home and there's something about seeing people kind of waking up, pressing into, and maybe even recovering some of their own practices, their delights, and it's just like these desires or these longings. I, I was really struck by the idea of like the long, like, but like when, when I can't, I don't know how you said it, Carmen and Sandra, when you were talking about the healing in the body, but there's a longing of the heart and the longing of the heart's unrecognized. As we see members kind of, of our community and artists nationally, internationally pass through, there is something about creating space and platforms um, to propel those longings, to give voice to those longings, or to give material um, resources to those longings. Um, I could go on and on. I'm gushing now, but um, you know, but I, I'm grateful for the space, and I and I'm, I'm happy um, to be a part of of what of 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 the many projects that we have have going on. Um, I see some. We want to give time to questions too. Um, and, and I know I have my own. Um, I think Debbie has a question. Uh, kind of calling attention that art cannot be, uh, took one Carmen articulate, art cannot be for explaining oppression. Um, and they agree and was wondering if uh, Sandra and Carmen could share your thoughts on the best way, um, you know, for us to, for us to kind of, like, how do, how do we want other artists and communities to kind of gather around that or looking for like, uh, if art's not to explain oppression, what are like the alternatives, right? Like, because I think that's some of the institutional frustration we've all spoke about. So what are some of those alternatives? What do you think, Sandra? Um, hmm. Well, I think an alternative is protests. I think an alternative is at like um, forms of activism that aren't necessarily embedded inside of like museum culture or not a museum culture, but inside of an exhibition. Um, uh, like I, I think there still are like, if, if you call it this, are like civic life or something um uh that's there uh, uh that we can engage in um but i also think that it's the interesting thing about what carmen was talking about is that it doesn't require any less work like the engagement um engaging in art or making art that isn't about explaining requires a lot of a, a lot of institutional back and forth there's still there's still that and so that pushing institutions to think about um black artists about um about uh the possibilities of what we can create still requires an immense amount of administrative function um uh administrative um, pushing and pulling, um, create uh, curatorial imagination, the pushing <laughs> and pulling of that, um, and that engagement takes just as much uh, work as the art does. And I've learned that from Carmen actually, and all of the things that they've had to um, kind of go through to make <laughs> to make work. I've been learning that um, slowly and surely. Um, it's 
I, I hope that makes some type of sense. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it still requires an, uh, an amount, an immense amount of engagement, but the, but what you're gaining is um, a form of expression that can, um, that can utilize the things that are trapped up in your body in a way that um, other things can't, um, other types of engagement can't. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I think just to add on to that is that, um, I think white people need to want to make art about being white people, you know, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. really disentangling, disemboweling themselves from white culture and a white worldview. And I don't mean it in a romantic sense, but really mm -hmm. there was a ritual, right, to become white mm -hmm. that has been passed on to others. That's not my work and it's not your work. Um, but I'm curious to see what that work would look like. And I'll also say that, you know, when artists do it, don't excuse it away. Matthew Barney makes work about whiteness all of the time, and no one ever talks about it in that way. Ever. You know? Don't ignore it when it comes into the gallery. Don't ignore it when it comes into the museum. You know, I think one of the most interesting pop culture films I've seen about whiteness was Terminator Genesis. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Gotta watch. I mean, like Linda Hamilton. I'm on it. They are beating down <laughs> those white machines, constructs, you know, they're just tearing them up, you know. Uh, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger has to sacrifice his white construct body. <laughs> mm. Wow. <laughs> wow. I wonder, Sandra, maybe we could start with you on this question and I want to pull on one of the, the themes and you touched on in your last response to this idea of like it comes out of the things that are trapped in the body and like right and they find and they they find them way out. And um, one of the uh, first kind of public programming events I went to um, with Carmen was, uh, Carmen did an artist talk on, uh, an artist on artist talk uh, on your uh, installation at MOCA, uh, mm -hmm. Cleveland, a terrible thing. And um, so in some ways I feel like some of the conversations that I've been having in this relationship where Carmen kind of uh, was catalyzed by my ex an experience that we had and shared around that work. And in your, um, when we were talking about like the things of pulling out of the body and we we're talking about how like when we take on like the pressures of institution and culture that they have to, it has, you said like earlier, it has to go somewhere. And you talked about that work as an excavation work, right? A personal mm -hmm. excavation, right? To find health. And I thought that was um, interesting because I, I was, how I was thinking a lot in my reflections and our conversation we had about a terrible thing was a lot of this work of the, these institutional, it was like an excavation of a, of the disease. Well, that'll be my, I'm not going to put that. You can say that or not, but like, in my view of like the disease of this particular institution and its history of being on a particular space on a particular land, what it's erased, mm -hmm. what it's been built upon. And I always thought about like that installation as like a real deep in, um, work of excavation. It was inviting in different kinds of excavations from the from the viewers and visitors. So I don't know if you mm -hmm. like think about pulling out the body. That's a long winded question, I know. But I was just curious if you could talk more about maybe a practice of excavation. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's interesting because the title of um, that exhibition came like uh, partially from this book about childhood trauma called The Terrible Thing Happened. And it's four children that go through trauma to um, kind of acknowledge uh, what happened. It's a, it's like a picture book, and so I just like dropped the happened and uh, uh, just adopted a terrible thing because of the um, uh, the history um, of that space. You know, I think that like I think that when 
uh, Carmen and I first started like talking on a um, on a on a regular basis, we were we were talking about our bodies and how it felt to be in our bodies, um, and um, all of the things that were kind of like were building up in really uh, just kind of in dangerous in dangerous ways that we were trying to figure out like what what do, what do we do to kind of to get rid of this and um i mean i've been thinking this is kind of a uh i don't know if i'm answering your question but i've been thinking about like death a lot i've been thinking about interruption a lot um i i got sick um in march in march um and i'm pretty sure i had coronavirus <laughs> Uh, cause I had all the symptoms, but, uh, that, you know, then the antibody test came out, uh, negative, but like, who, like it's, it's the whole kind of, you know, woo woo of, of, of Corona, of Corona time. And, um, I was thinking, okay, like, you know, I have pre existing condition of being a fat person, a fat black woman. Um, I could die, you know, I could die. What how? Is is this a good death? I don't think so. I don't think this is a. I don't think this is a good. Would be a good death. And I was afraid. I was like very very afraid of um, of dying. And then my grandpa passed away, and it just became concrete and real in in some sense that like people die. My grandfather was the first person in my family. Um, I'm 33 years old, and he's the first person in my family to pass away and um, to be interrupted. And um, it's been really difficult to think about. It's been difficult. But now I'm thinking about what these, um, I'm, I'm thinking about the objects that I, that I make, the machines, the, the, the creatures, um, uh, the creatures that um, permeate the worlds that I that I um, make in my installations, and I'm trying to understand them um, as beings um, that can be prolonged. So, if that is inside of the care of an institution, if that is inside of the ca a care of the installation space, um, inside of the studio, I'm trying to think about the lives of the artwork. In, I I thought I was thinking about that before, but in dealing with my own mortality, it's made me think about it. It's it's uh and it's it feels urgent. Yeah. It feels more urgent than it ever has before. Um, you the know, lives of the artwork. Yes. Yeah. No. It's it 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 what you're sharing and and the intensity in which you're sharing with it. Um. It, it just resonates with me um, cause, because I, I almost died in January of this year, you know, mm -hmm. um, and there's something about how I attended to that awareness that catalyzed an urgency in the making. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's as mm -hmm. close to the edge I, as I can get, but I'm, but it, but it's um, the way you encapsulated it. It it just feels um, important to to mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope I answered your question, Russell. That's just like where I went. Um, <laughs> thinking. <laughs> Very much yeah, just so. Thinking. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I would like to just also invite others to whether they like to put a question in the chat box or speak a question into the community. Um, you know, there's a, um, I think there's just a desire that I have to hear other voices.
<laughs> people are leaving now that you said, uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Are there more questions perhaps or impressions or things that have resonated um, with folks? Yes, you can raise your hand to be emoji. saying about like being confronted with mortality was very that's just something that I've been thinking about as well um, so I wanted to ask I guess I wanted to ask like how do you sense of the knowledge that your own existence is constantly like being attacked by like these systems, like these oppressive systems by like white supremacy, by capitalism. Like how do you like, make, make sense of that specifically in like your connections and like in your work? Um, Do you want to take that, Carmen? No, the question was to you. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I think the reason I'm trying to um, pass it along is because I'm still trying to figure that out. Gotcha. Like, gotcha. actively, actively. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the question. Did Amani ask that question? I, I believe so, yes. Oh, thank you, Amani. Um, uh, and, yeah, uh, my, my grandfather died and then George, George Floyd died. And in between that, Breonna Taylor, uh, um, you know, and it was all of it. It was a accumulation of all of those things. And um, yeah, I, I was sorry to like, uh, to repeat myself, but yeah, it's that, um, that moment when I, when I realized in the, hearing the news about the pandemic that like I like my um my my godfather um uh passed and I didn't know him very well but he uh that he he passed and all of the my mom's first cousins like a handful of them um and trying to understand myself inside of a family unit um trying to understand myself inside of the studio um I, I don't know. I really don't know. And I sometimes wonder how I'm able to wake up and function, truly. Um, yeah, just, that's just my honest answer right mm. now. Yeah. Mm. I think, Sandra, to to be a divergent voice in this conversation around this. You know, it's, it's some, there's, I need to raise our awareness around the, the paradox of being able to name all the things that you just named, you know? Mm -hmm. Because for me, the reason I have the capacity that I have to speak plainly about the conditions of our lives here and now is because I deeply know and am aware of what is possible for this world. Mm. I constantly mm -hmm. am aware of what I know is possible. Mm -hmm. And nothing that this system does that causes anger, pain, rage, uh, grief, 
takes me away from that knowing. It is happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But unless you give yourself the gift of the experience of what is possible and allowing yourself to take it in, then you will succumb to these powers and principalities, to empire and imperialism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. So for me, again, that's what the work is. That's what the art is. Mm -hmm. It's knowing what possibility is. And showing people what is possible. Letting mm -hmm. them embody it and investigate it in themselves. Mm -hmm. if they choose to. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked a question <clears throat> and, and asked to return to the question of, I just, I just saw it. Um, oh, maybe it was in the chat, not the Q&A. Um, it said, oh, can we both speak to liminality, the crossroads as a functional space or force of potential within your practice and lives? And I, and mm -hmm. I think for me, a part of the crossroads is the intersection of the what is and what I know is possible. Like that intersection mm. is required for me in order to make something, in order to even be open to the conceptualization of a work, you know? Mm. Yes. Um, I think for me, it exists in the thingly. Mm. Think, thingly being, um, mm -hmm. the ability to um, morph and, trans, and transmute. Yes. Um, and again, thinking about the flesh again, thinking about what the, all the possibilities of the flesh and mm -hmm. and and also uh, fucking with temporality and the mm -hmm. uh, notion of space mm -hmm. and time because i think that's the other limiting belief is that this is a a straight line of experience versus a, an accumulative almost mm -hmm. like a, like a mound building experience is what we're having you know mhm mm mhm mm yes Hey, Carmen, Sandra, thank you for doing this. I'm wondering, hey, Will, uh, <laughs> wondering, Sandra, if you can speak of, uh, to the idea Carmen just raised, but about what is possible in relation to the recurring motif of the chroma key. Oh, yeah, the chroma yes, key yes, is, yes. yeah, the space of post-production where everyone gathers to create a world, to mm -hmm. create a new world. Um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a space that, uh, that needs... Um, direction <laughs> it's a space that needs uh ushers um uh but it is a space of possibility you just gotta watch it a little bit though you gotta watch it um because <laughs> that's a possibility of anything you know um for me uh, that I, for me that's the edge of the woods conceptually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know that um you know even the power of the potential of my practice cannot be at the center of anything. So even the notion and construct of inclusion is at my cost, at my peril. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be included. You need to come mm -hmm. physically move your ass to be in this yes. standpoint and get curious about what you see right here. Because mm -hmm. the moment I move, to the place where you ask me to, to the comfortable place, quote unquote, at the table, my power mm -hmm. is gone. Yes. Within that construct. And I, mm -hmm. and, and I refuse. I think the other part of, 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 of what you're talking about with the chroma key is a refusal. It's a mm -hmm. space of refusal because all that is possible is in that standpoint. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. We don't take on the image. We are every image. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Which, is, which is why I do not have a preferred gender pronoun. Mm -hmm. I am Carmen. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, did you watch uh, Lovecraft Country the other day? <laughs> 
I am I'm, I'm two episodes I'm two episodes behind. I know I gotta watch it before we talk again this week. <laughs> I gotta watch it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're really liking the show. It's very ambitious. It's fun. It's a fun show. Yes. But the point of it is, what is the what's the medium for the experimentation, and do we mm-hmm. as black people get to experiment and and do weird. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. people, people, somebody called it um, Indiana Jenkins or something like that. (laughs) But I think it's more like, um, uh, I would, I would, I would, I I would compare it more to like a um, David Lynch TV show, Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, because this, you know, it was a coin toss, which uh, episode was good. Um, uh, What was the show? about the Um, Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks, Peaks, yes. It's, Mm -hmm. I would say it's more akin to Twin Peaks than, um, Mm -hmm. you know, a comparative by episode. Mm -hmm. Almost, it's almost like, um, is it, is it called episodic? Like an episodic kind of like, it's a little connected Mm -hmm. um, to each other, but yeah, I'm really loving the ability to, uh, for them to be able to experiment, to show us, to show us different worlds, all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And also to to frame a world from a character who typically would not be seen, their their world would not right. be viewed mm-hmm. or investigated or any curiosity about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is actually how Sandra and I talk, for real. <laughs> yeah, that's why. <laughs> Like there are some silences, there are some, you know, things and all that, but that's, this is truly how it goes down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty soon we're going to start talking about hair. <laughs> <laughs> did you, I, I redid it. I redid it. <laughs> Zoom kabuki, you know. Um, uh, I think the other piece for me that we're showing you but not talking about is the function of humor in a creative practice, in friendship, as a material for, uh, you know, opening up a pathway to our sense of freedom in our body, you know, because most of the things we're laughing at are funny, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I want more humor paradoxically in my work, um, Mm -hmm. the more difficult um, I experience the subject matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you say your work was funny? (laughs) I I, I I definitely say that my work is funny. But I, you know, I don't know if other people would consider. No one would say it was funny. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I, I think I'm like hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, it's all about interpretation, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But it's really necessary. It's needed. It's needed in these, in these spaces of, like you're talking about, of, of, of difficulty. It's about multiplicity of being. Mm -hmm. It's about. Um, being able to hold many things in your body at the same time, which is what we have to do. Yes. Um, So I'm aware of our time. And so I don't want to simply close us out, but we have about 10 minutes left. So I want to invite not just a question, but if people want to share impact and speak it into the space so that we can move towards closing ourselves out and feeling complete. I also want to say thank you to Billy Sanders, who is, I, this is the first time I've met you, and you are dope as fuck. Can I just say yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> like, I just want to walk around my life with you, you know? Um, <laughs> and I, I wish I could grow uh, mutton chops like that. That's so <laughs> sweet, you know? <laughs> but I am so full of gratitude for you being with us this evening. Thank you all. So if if anyone wants to, again, um, kind of signal 
we can unmute and give voice if anyone wants to make a contribution, have a check-in, um, uh, an impression. Aha, there's a comment, uh, there's a question from Johnny Coleman in the chat. Oh, it's, it's more of a reflection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing, oh, feeling thanks, Nina John. Simone. Hmm. That would be accurate. You know, um, my grandmother um, is from Lorraine, Ohio. Um, hmm. She graduated uh, Lorraine High School before Toni Morrison. She was the first Black student to be in the National Honor Society at Lorraine wow. High and the first black student to be allowed in extracurricular activities at Lorraine High School. So her experience cracked open the potentiality for what Tony's experience was in that space. Mm. And to say, if you meet black people <laughs> from Lorraine, particularly elder women, it's a very, it's the vibe is all very, I mean, I'm not that Tony isn't a genius, you know, she is. And it's, it's, there is something geophysical about how blackness and our meaning making is expressed from that landscape. Mm. That's a great word. Well, we can wow. certainly close ourselves out, Sandra, if, if no one else wants to kind of speak into the space. But um, it's always a pleasure to talk with you and to be inspired by you. And to be challenged Carmen, by you. Carmen, you're the best. <laughs> I always love speaking with you and um, always leave with so much to um, resonate with. I so appreciate your friendship. And Sandra will be with us at Atonsic in January of 2021 as the inaugural recipient of the Carol A. Brantley Reading Residency. It's in service of artists and change catalysts to rest, to be present with themselves, and that Atonsic has the honor and privilege of hosting and providing radical hospitality to them. Um, and it's an honor that Sandra said yes to be the first. It's named after my mentor, um, an equity consultant named Carol Brantley, who taught me so much and is embodied in my presence today. So she is with us too. Um, and she offered hospitality in her own home to me in the development of my practice. And so it's something I want to offer to others um, as a as a central premise to our practice of being together. And I would also like to add that I'll be making a brand new work uh, that will be on permanent installation um, at Atonzik. So I am so happy, so, so happy to be making um, that work and then also to be resting there. I can't wait. <laughs> Hmm. So, Carmen, oh, Carmen, Sandra, mm -hmm. thank you so much uh, for this. Um, do we feel our, our work is complete? Was it Dylan, would you like to kind of chime in? I think all the thank yous have been said, um, only mm -hmm. to add, um, you know, thank you from, uh, from EFA and EFA Project Space um, to everybody. And thank you for bringing us into this conversation. I think that there's so many resonances that will be thinking about um, over the, the coming days and weeks and hopefully be, uh, continue to be in conversation with, with you all. And um, just, to, just to say the thanks to everybody who's here in attendance and asking questions. And um, you know, this would be the time when we'd be milling around after the talk in the gallery, mm -hmm. awkwardly <laughs> hanging out, having a reception. So go, go have a glass of wine, hopefully you can pour some tea. And um, yeah, and hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks so much again. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, uh, EFA. Uh, thank you, Judy. And thank you, Billy and Amani for all the work that went in uh, to facilitating. Hi, Judy, thank you so much. Um, 
I've, I've, it's been a pleasure knowing each other. And Carmen and I were talking the other day and uh, just one sharing of gratitude is like all of the relationships and all of the time that it took to put this together. I just wanted to kind of honor that. And it was the right relationships in waiting and in the right time. And then to be able to like facilitate, uh, uh, to kind of bring into view Sandra and, and Carmen's practices and to witness that it's, um, it's really wonderful. And, the t and one of the many takeaways is investing in those friendships and, and making those mm -hmm. interventions. So I am very grateful uh, for that and, and to Atomtic and to EFA. Uh, is our, our work Bye, is done? Bye, everyone. <laughs> we are complete. Thank you all so oh. much. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Imani. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, um, uh, Arthur. And thank you, Carmen. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll see you in Cleveland. <laughs> yes. Um, so excited. <laughs>